Hey, fifth graders, welcome back to another episode of Nowhere Boy. When we left off, Max was trying to convince Ahmed that they need to tell an adult. He'll be leaving in a few months. Um, they can't figure out how to get his mom, uh, Ahmed's mom, in for a conference. So let's see what happens. Let's see, chapter 41. Here we go. Okay, chapter 41. On the morning of Tuesday, March 22nd, Ahmed woke up after six. With the sunrise now around 6.30, he knew he'd have to get ready quickly. He threw his clothes and rushed out to the furniture room to check the orchids. He was hopping on one foot trying to shove on a sneaker when he nearly toppled over. On the spike of the healthiest orchid were tiny pale green buds. Something's blooming. Only three days were left before the parent-teacher conference. Yikes, they still don't have a plan. Just as he promised, Ahmed had been thinking about what he wanted to do. It was hard to share Max's faith that adults would protect him, especially after he had broken so many laws. But he wouldn't be telling alone. Max would be with him. As he gazed at the buds, they seemed like a good omen, a message from the universe that everything would be okay. By the time Ahmed scaled the garden wall and made his way to Square Virgo, the sky was turning a bright, cloudless blue. The peace had promised of a sunny day, of warm moods lifted by spring, of friends in football, calmed him. Only later did he realize that he had forgotten the most important lesson of war. When you least expect it, chaos always returns. Oh no. Je viens chercher Max. I've come for Max. A familiar voice jarred Ahmed from Madame Legrand's lecture on the Thirty Years' War. He looked up to find Max's mother standing in the doorway. So they're at school and Max's mother has shown up to take Max home. Wisps of hair stuck out around her face and she sounded out of breath. Ahmed glanced at the clock on the wall. It was barely 9.30. Why was she picking up Max now? He hadn't mentioned a doctor's appointment. Madame Legrand wrinkled her brow, clearly taken aback by the interruption. Ahmed looked at Max, but he just blinked and stared, as confused as everyone else. The directrice says it's okay, Max's mother said in French, waving Max up, up out of his chair. Madame Legrand cocked her head at Max. Go on. Max quickly gathered up the books and papers on his desk, then with an almost imperceptible shrug in Ahmed's direction, followed his mother out of class. As soon as the door closed behind them, Madame Legrand went back to discussing the peace, peace of Westphalia. Ahmed told himself that Max's mother must have forgotten an appointment, but just as he began to focus back on Madame Legrand's lecture, the door to the room opened and a man Ahmed had never seen before walked in. He too seemed breathless, like he was in a great hurry. I'm taking Charlotte, he said. Outside in the hall, Ahmed saw a few other parents leaving with their kids. Any ideas, fifth graders? It's kind of reminding me of 9-11. Parents showed up at school to get their kids. Something was going on. Something bad enough, frightening enough, that they were taking their children home. Ahmed could only think of one thing, a terror attack. His chest tightened. He couldn't breathe. Max's mother would get him home safely. They were only two blocks away. But what about Max's father and sister? The terrorists could be attacking government buildings like the one where Max's father worked, or even worse, schools. Madame Legrand had figured out that something serious was going on as well because she walked the man, who was clearly Charlotte's father, out into the hall and closed the door behind them. What's going on, Ferris said. As if in answer, a siren wailed in the distance. Jules and Andre ran to the window. No go near window, Ahmed shouted. Everyone stared at him. Ahmed felt his face turn red. He was just trying to keep them safe, but it might sound like he knew what was going on out there. What if they thought he was a terrorist or knew the terrorists? A balled up piece of paper landed on Ahmed's desk. He picked it up and smoothed it out. Stay calm, it read in English. Ahmed caught Oscar's eye and nodded, but it was hard not to panic. He was an illegal refugee. He had forged paperwork. The whole city would be looking for young men like him. 
He just wanted to run back to Max's house and hide in the cellar. But running away now would seem suspicious. And he was safer here in school than he'd be on the streets with the terrorists, soldiers, and police. When Madame Legrand returned, she dismissed Charlotte, then went back to the history lecture. But this time, even she seemed distracted, forgetting her point and gazing out the window. It was a relief when Madame Bertrand, the directrice, walked in. She whispered for a minute with Madame Legrand, then turned to address the class, so she's the principal. Ahmed understood some phrases. Explosion at the airport. Some parents have taken their children home. The school is locked now. She seemed to be assuring them that they were safe, but the frantic bleeding of the sirens outside made Ahmed wonder what she wasn't telling them. The day continued as if it were no different than any other. Madame Legrand showed them how to solve for X. Ah, uh, there's always comfort in math. They learned a Zumba dance in gym, and back in class they discussed the fables of La Fontaine and the moral lessons they taught. But it wasn't a normal day. No one clowned, or clowned around or misbehaved, and Ahmed could see from the worried faces that everyone's thoughts were elsewhere. Ahmed knew exactly how they felt. Did it really matter if they could solve for X when the city was under attack and their families were possibly out there? He wished he could tell them that it did, that even the illusion of normal life could help you put one foot in front of the other and walk the tightrope of disaster. I love that. I'm going to read that again because I think the author and I think Ahmed is right here. Ahmed knew exactly how they felt. Did it really matter if they could solve for X when the city was under attack and their families were possibly out there? He wished he could tell them that it did because, of course, he's had more too much experience with this, right, fifth graders? that even the illusion of normal life could help you put one foot in front of the other and walk the tightrope of disaster. At lunch and over recess, rumors and stories began to spread. Oscar reported that he'd overheard the secretary telling one of the teachers that the airport had been blown up. Madame Mansori had confided to Farah that the Malbec metro station had been attacked too. Ahmed felt ill as he remembered riding past this stop on the back of Mike Max's bike on the way to the Magritte Museum. There was possibly also a bomb at the Schumann Metro near the European Commission headquarters, though no one knew for sure. This is bad, Farah repeated again and again. Ahmed knew she wasn't talking about him and his life, but hers. Every Muslim in Brussels would be a suspect, at least in the minds of non-Muslim Europeans. Ahmed knew he could never tell the truth now. The authorities would lock him up or deport him back to Turkey. As he played a half-hearted game of football during recess, Ahmed noticed that there were no commercial planes in the sky, only police helicopters looping low over the neighborhood. The whoosh of the rotors sorry, one second, reminded him of the helicopters back home, the ones that dropped bombs, and he had to stifle the urge to run inside. You're fine, Oscar whispered to him after one of the helicopters buzzed particularly low. Just make it through the day. You'll be safe at Max's. Um, Oscar continues to surprise me with his resolve to be a good friend and to be an ally to Ahmed. But Ahmed noticed that Oscar didn't talk about the next day and the day after that. In just a few hours, everything had changed and Max wasn't there to reassure him. By the afternoon, even Madame Legrand could no longer keep up the pretense that it was a normal day. For the last hour of school, she let them draw de San Hudo, or happy pictures. Ahmed sketched without thinking. It was a way to keep his mind calm, clear. What do you think he drew? I was thinking his family, but that's a beautiful garden, M Madame Legrand said, standing over him. Merci, Madame. He had drawn the garden behind Max's house. Madame Legrand asked him if she could hang it up in class. There was no polite way, Ahmed felt, to say no, but he would have liked to have kept it. Chapter 42. All morning long, Max watched the same images loop in constant replay on CNN International and the BBC, screaming people running down the airport road as smoke billowed from the terminal behind them bloody commuters stumbling out of the Malbec metro station. 
He watched them on the TV in his parents' bedroom as his parents and Claire fielded emails and calls from worried family and friends. 32 people had died and hundreds more had been injured. By afternoon, the images were seared into his brain and the only thought that made him feel any better was that the people he loved were safe. His mother had not taken the metro that morning, deciding to walk instead. His father had picked up Claire and driven her home, and Ahmed was presumably still at the School of Happiness, which, like the rest of the schools in Brussels, had gone into lockdown soon after his mother had picked them up. Around two, the doorbell rang, startling his mother. Who's that? His father jogged down the stairs. Could it possibly be Ahmed? Max darted after him. Don't open if you don't know who it is, his mother called after him. For once, his father took her advice and looked out the kitchen window. Don't worry, it's just that police officer. Oh, I'm glad Ahmed's not there. Inspector Fontaine was standing on the stoop, a grave expression on his face. Max's heart thumped. Ahmed wasn't there, thankfully. But what if Fontaine wanted to see the wine cellar? Oh, I didn't think of that. Max wondered if he should run downstairs and clear out Ahmed's stuff, but there was no time. His father was already opening the door. As Fontaine stepped into the vestibule, Claire appeared on the stairs and bugged out her eyes at Max. I am so sorry to disturb you, Monsieur, how weird, Fontaine said, but after the attacks of this morning, there is a state of urgency. Max realized he meant state of emergency, which we have been under, right, for several months with, for COVID-19. But Fontaine seemed rattled and Max wasn't about to correct his English. The cop's eyes darted from Max to Claire to Max's mother, who raced down the steps past Claire. It's horrible, she said. Do you think there'll be more? I do not know, Madame, Fontaine said somberly. The counter-terror division has transmissions from the plotters and their accomplices. Many of them are coded, but I can, can assure you we are following every lead. I hope you catch them, his father said. I have made it my personal mission, Monsieur, but all of us must help, which is why I've come by. I wish, you have my, I wish you to have my mobile number. Fontaine scribbled on the back of a card and handed it to Max's father. If you see anything that is not ordinary, call me. Do not hesitate. These terrorists are not just in Molen Beak. Right now they can be hiding anywhere. Arab men, young ones in particular, who are secretive, who act bizarre, who trespass. Max felt like he couldn't breathe. Fontaine was basically telling the whole neighborhood to look for someone like Ahmed. How long would it take for one of the neighbors to betray them, just as a neighbor had betrayed Albert Jeannard and Ralph? See something, say something, as we say in America, his father said. Exactement. And the children, too. He glanced at Max, then Claire. Listen to them. Sometimes they are more observant than adults. Fontaine allowed himself a faint smile. Max glanced at Claire, willing her to stay quiet. She turned away and headed back up the stairs. Fontaine gave him a reassuring pat on the soldier. We will catch, shoulder, we will catch them, Max. Do not worry. Ti inquite pa. Chapter 43. When the bell finally rang for dismissal, Ahmed followed the rest of the class down to the courtyard. Only then did the strained calm of the day disintegrate. The parents and other caregivers who normally came into the courtyard for pickup were nowhere to be seen, and the sliding door to the street was still locked. Everyone began to talk at once, and Madame Monsieuri and the other aides were forced to shout over the hubbub. Since parents were not allowed to enter the school for security reasons, they explained, kids would be released to them one by one through the sliding door. Uh-oh. I'm going to be looking for his mother. Madame Bertrand, the directrice, was outside explaining the new rule to parents. Ahmed chewed on a dry cuticle. Did she say about kids who go home alone, he asked Oscar in English. Oscar shook his head. Maybe you can just go. Ahmed slipped into the line, already sneaking through the passageway to the door. But when he finally reached the front, he realized that Madame Monsieur wasn't alone. Inspector Fontaine flanked the door on the other side. Oh, no. For the first time, Ahmed noticed a gun in his holster. But before Ahmed could back away, the police officer saw him. Ahmed! Ahmed's heart pounded in his ears. Bonjour, monsieur, he said automatically. How are you? What a stupid thing to say, thought Ahmed. But it was a wonder he could say anything. His legs felt like they might crumble beneath him. 
not well. You know what has happened. You know what has happened? His tone was sharp, as if Ahmed had had something to do with it. Ahmed nodded. It is very bad. Yes, it is, Fontaine said, as if Ahmed's response had been insufficient. He looked back and scanned the crowd of parents. Where's your mother? Ahmed couldn't speak, so he just shook his head and held up his pass. But Fontaine didn't even bother to look at it. Surely your mother is coming. He was right. What kind of mother would allow her child to go home on the day of a terror attack? Even if Ahmed said she was sick or couldn't get to school because the metro was down, it would seem strange that she hadn't sent someone to fetch him. Fetch him. She not able, Ahmed choked out. Oh no, I read. Ahmed could tell from the furrow that appeared in the police officer's brow that this answer bothered him. Fontaine opened his mouth, but before he could say anything, a voice crackled over his radio. He pulled it off the clip on his belt and turned slightly away. Fontaine, I am listening. Ahmed slipped past him, plunging into the crowd of parents. Whew. The parents must have thought he was making his way to someone on the outer edge of the crowd because they easily let him through, then shuffled forward and closed ranks tightly behind him. It was as if, Ahmed thought, in their eagerness to co collect their children and bring them safely home, they became his protectors too. Within seconds, he popped out on the other side of the crowd. But before he turned the corner, Ahmed glanced back. Fontaine was talking to the directrice. Ahmed hoped it was just about whatever he had heard over his radio. But then Fontaine pointed right at him. Oh no! Ahmed's every instinct blared an alarm. Police officer was on to him. Fontaine was asking Madame Bertrand questions that would lead to more questions. Soon enough, it'd be a knock at Max's door and trouble for everyone. Oh no. Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll catch you next time. This is too intense. All right, bye sweet kids.